Hi and welcome back. Today I'm going to quickly put this unit together. Uh, I'm kind of anxious to see how it turns out. I think it's going to work out great, but you never know until you actually get these things put together. So I'm going to put the anvil block together and I want to put the uh, uh, swage block in its uh, hardy hole to make sure that it fits and everything works out fine that way. And then I'll do a little bit of forging just to get a quick idea of how this is going to work out. So the first thing I want to do is just go around everything with a set square just to get a feeling for how parallel the sides of the holes are and where I need to start taking the material off. I was actually quite happy with how the holes turned out. There really wasn't a lot of material that I had to remove so I thought this was going to be a pretty quick part of the job. As it turns out the plasma cutter tends to heat treat the edges of the cut because it heats and cools the material so quickly. This is mild steel and, you know, there isn't enough carbon in it to make any tools, but, you know, it still heat treats enough to be a nuisance and the file is basically just skating across. So I have to heat up all of this metal and draw the temper so that I can get the file to bite into the surface. If I had a furnace big enough to put this in, I would throw it all in and get it up to a nice cherry red heat and let it cool slowly so it would be very, very soft. But the best I'm going to be able to manage to do is to get it up to about 700 degrees and that will make it soft enough for the file to bite into the surface. You can see here it's kind of hard to read, but I'm kind of bouncing between 650 and 700 here. So I'm going to make sure that that temperature is right through the whole plate and then I'll let it cool slowly and get back to work. So I finally got to the filing and I really underestimated how much time this was going to take. Uh, I basically just did three holes. I wanted the hardy hole in the anvil, I needed the square hole for the base of the anvil, and I wanted the hardy hole that was going to hold the swage block. Those three I definitely need to be able to use this unit. The other two holes in the surface I can get them done at a later time. It really doesn't hamper anything, but I need these three to be able to use the unit. So I did that. It took me probably the better part of two hours to do that so uh, if you have a machinist friend or somebody that you know offers to help definitely take them up on it. it'll save you a lot of filing because I still have another unit like this to do as well as three other anvils and uh, you know that's going to be a lot of filing but I can do that whenever I get around to it uh, so that isn't too bad but this is definitely a part of the process that uh, I underestimated. But all in all, I'm still happy with uh, having the work done. So as you can see, there's nothing mysterious about this part of the process. You just do a little bit of filing, you know, test it, do a little bit more filing, try to estimate where it's jamming up, and then, you know, take the metal away in that spot. I'm in a bit of a hurry here because I need this in a couple of weeks, but when I do the other plates, I'm definitely going to set up a furnace and fully anneal the whole block so that you know we'll speed up this process tremendously. Another thing I thought of too is I'm probably going to make one of those little uh, miniature uh, belt sander grinder units that fit into tight spaces like this. That'll speed the process along as well. So. You know, I have options, but I just don't have time to play around with that right now. I'm also test fitting the piece quite often because I want to make sure that I don't remove too much material and make the hardy hole too sloppy. So at this point I'm done with all the file work that I'm doing right now, so I'm ready to just do the weld prep that I need to assemble the actual anvil block. I'm not getting too carried away here, I'm just basically running a bead around the outside. Uh, you know, I've had a lot of discussions with people about this and, you know, most people think that it has to be one solid piece from the center on out and I totally disagree with that. The main body of the anvil really isn't under a lot of stress. So the welds just really need to tie everything together so that it can work as a unit and give you the mass that you're looking for for the anvil. 
I don't feel there is any advantage to having every face and every edge welded solid. The only exception to that is if you decided that you did want to put a hard steel face on this and heat treat it. That does require a lot more work and a lot more consideration. But a simple anvil like this that's just going to be welded up and left alone, that really isn't necessary. And I certainly don't think there's any real advantage to going to all that extra effort. So one of the things I'm hoping to demonstrate with this unit is to show that, you know, the mass of the anvil is what's important. It doesn't have to be a solid piece. As long as the pieces are connected and tied together in some way, they will act as a unit and work as an anvil. Now I'm not disputing that high carbon steel anvils are going to last a lot longer than a mild steel anvil and certainly this anvil. That isn't my point. The problem that I have is that a lot of experienced smiths or so-called experienced smiths are telling newcomers that they can't forge on anything else but a high carbon steel anvil. And that of course is nonsense. It's the mass of the anvil that's important and the inertia that it provides to resist the hammer blows. What it's actually made of is really secondary. As long as it stays put under the hammer, it's an anvil and it's usable. So assemble whatever you have to, do whatever you can to get your first anvil together and get to work. That's important. Don't wait around for that perfect anvil that everyone you know, says you have to have before you can start. Put something together and get to work. Okay, having said that, even though I'm going pretty minimal on the welds here, I still need them to hold together. So I'm just tacking the corners right now, and then once I have that assembled so that it's one unit, I'll go out, preheat it again, and then I'll do the actual welds. If I don't preheat, uh, and I'm a big fan of preheating because the mass of the anvil block is going to suck the heat out of the weld so quickly it'll make them brittle. So when you're hammering on this piece that could cause the welds to break. But if you preheat, you don't have to preheat a lot. You know, 300 degrees Fahrenheit is lots. You just want to make sure that there's a massive heat in the anvil so that when you add more heat to that with the welding rod it doesn't tend to suck into the metal and cool too quickly. That'll allow the uh, well to anneal and be strong and you know as you'll see hopefully in a moment here you really need very minimal welding to have something that works. So I managed to get this up to about 350 degrees and that's plenty for what I'm doing here. You just want to make sure that there's enough heat inside the center of the block so that there isn't a massive difference between the weld area and the center so that will allow the weld to cool slowly. So I'm just going around everything with a pretty simple bead. It's just 6011 rod, nothing special. So here's how the whole thing fits together. I have the anvil block sitting at the edge of the base plate. The uh, swage block fits into the larger hardy hole in the base plate. And as I mentioned earlier, the other two smaller holes are the same as the hardy hole in the anvil, which is the same as the hardy hole in my main anvil. So I'll be able to trade off any of the tools that I have for my main anvil and be able to plug it into this unit. The anvil is not welded to the base plate. I have the anvil mounted on a square peg and that fits into a square hole in the base plate and that allows me to mount it in any number of configurations. So that allows me to spin the anvil around if I want the round or the square horn to be sitting over the edge of the base plate. It also allows me to remove the anvil altogether if it's in the way or if I'm moving it. One of the things I was concerned about was whether that square peg was going to be enough to anchor this anvil in place. Quite often with hardy tools, they're not really much larger than the shank that's holding them, and they tend to dance around quite a bit as you're using it. But this has a wide enough base that it really just sits down on the anvil, and it really doesn't want to move at all. And the square peg is basically just to keep it from sliding from side to side. So I just want to give you a quick demo to show you how well this unit actually works. 
I'm just forging a simple taper, it's nothing complicated, but you know, this anvil is working pretty much the same way as my main anvil. And you'll notice that this unit isn't tied down in any way, it's just sitting on the face of my anvil, and despite that, I'm getting through this taper just as quickly as I would on my main anvil. So once I build a base for this unit and lock the base plate down, uh, I really don't see a problem with this. It's a good little anvil. The anvil itself weighs about 55 pounds or so, and the base plate weighs about 60. So that's a pretty substantial anvil for uh, a beginner. There's certainly a lot you can do with that. And don't worry about this quick demo. I'm thinking I'm going to set this up as my main anvil for the next little while. Uh, so you'll you're going to get to see more work done on it and you know I'll certainly be able to fine-tune it as I go so you know you'll be uh, included in that whole process of course. And for those of you who are interested in getting a copy of this design I've added a link in the description for that file. Just let people know where you got it and pass my channel name around and we'll call it even. We'll see you next time. Hi I'm Dennis and thanks for watching. If you're interested in supporting this channel, the simplest way, of course, is to like, comment, and subscribe. If you have questions and you want to contact me directly, you can do so by emailing me at either one of the addresses that I have listed here. It may take me a couple of days, but I will get back to you. Of course, financial support is always welcome. The only product that I produce is the information contained in these free videos. So if you like the work that I'm doing and the videos that I'm putting out and you can spare a couple of dollars a month, consider becoming a patron by clicking the orange Patreon logo at the bottom of the screen. Thank you and we'll see you next time.